Hey, Prime members, you can listen to Killer Psyche ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the app today. A listener note. This episode contains adult content and is not suitable for everyone. Please be advised. You may have seen the original TV series, Dr. Death, airing now on Peacock, or listen to the Wondery podcast it was based on. Season 3, Dr. Death, Miracle Man. For those who have not, the Dr. Death series tells the real-life stories of doctors who have used their professions to do the unthinkable. Not by solving medical mysteries or saving lives, but by taking them. The show is based on Wondery's Dr. Death podcast, and its second season is called Dr. Death, Cutthroat Con Man. Cutthroat Con Man stars Edgar Ramirez as the Italian surgeon Paolo Macchiarini and Mandy Moore as the TV executive Benita Alexander, who falls not only for his multitude of lies, but falls for him romantically. Paolo became an international medical superstar for his stem cell research and the development of a synthetic trachea replacement. But his years of surgery and falsified research left a slew of patients who died an excruciatingly painful death. This is the story of one of the most dangerous con men in medical history and how the lies he told not only ruined multiple lives, but also took them. Mind of a Monster, the podcast from ID, is back, and this season they're covering The Butcher Baker. In the 80s, over 20 women go missing in Anchorage, Alaska. Women turning up dead in the woods and others are kidnapped. But their stories are not taken seriously by the police, even though these crimes all point to one man. On this podcast, uncover how serial killer Richard Hansen evades arrest for over a decade. And hear from the victims, along with police and Alaska State Troopers, who were there on the ground investigating this case. Listen to Mind of a Monster, The Butcher Baker on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. 2024 is all about new beginnings. And to help you become the best version of yourself this year, Cerebral just launched their newest innovation designed to support you in reaching your mental health goals. It's called Cerebral Way, a personalized path to mental wellness that is designed specifically around your unique needs and experiences. Your cerebral therapist or prescriber will outline a customized plan with clear milestones along the way, so you can get to feeling your best in 2024. Sign up today at Cerebral.com slash podcast and use code WONDERY to get 15% off your first month. Offer only valid on monthly plans. Other exclusions may apply. Offer ends April 30th. See site for details. From Wondery and Treefort Media, I'm Candace DeLong, and this is the third season of Killer Psyche. I was a psychiatric nurse, and then an FBI criminal profiler. In the five decades I've spent studying people's minds, I've interviewed countless murderers, including many serial killers. Why did they do it? To get a satisfying answer, we have to dive deep into their psyche to figure out what made them do what they did. This episode is Dr. Death, Paolo Macchiarini. In reading up on this week's episode, I came across an article that was published before Dr. Paolo Macchiarini's crimes were uncovered. At the time, he was a well-known, seemingly well-respected pioneer in the growing field of stem cell research. 
In that piece, he quoted poet and writer T.S. Eliot. He said, and I quote, only those who risk going too far can possibly find out how far one can go. He was speaking about his scientific endeavors, but I think this actually sums up how he lived his entire life. He was constantly pushing the limits with his lies and testing how far he could take them. He did not care about the repercussions or the consequences of his deceits. So who was this lying risk taker? Paolo Macchiarini was charming, handsome, and some would say brilliant. He was a surgeon who was passionate about advancing medical science and providing exciting new options in the world of transplants and artificial organs. And he was going to be the one to do it, or so it seemed. The lies Paolo told in his personal life would have just made him a con man. But unfortunately, the lies he spewed in his professional life often resulted in death. Macchiarini had a very prestigious path to becoming an internationally renowned surgeon. He was seen by some as a miracle worker. His resume showed that he studied medicine in Italy, France, and the United States, and was a full professor at medical schools in Germany and Spain. That is, one of his resumes had that information. According to later reports, most of his credentials did not match up, not in the timeline, and not through the institutions themselves. In 2008, Paolo was thought to have revolutionized the world of medicine when he performed the first transplant of a donor trachea using stem cells from the patient's own body. This procedure was meant to help minimize organ rejection and the need for powerful immunosuppressive drugs. The press referred to the operation as the dawn of the stem cell revolution with Macchiarini himself calling it a major achievement in the history of medicine. We did not know then that this, like most things that Paolo did, was a lie. The patient suffered very serious complications from the transplant, but that fact was kept quiet for a long time. This taste of fame kicked his ambitions into high gear, Over the next eight years, he rocketed to the status of superstar surgeon. He was pioneering a hot new field that lacked experts or research, so he was able to go mostly unchallenged. There were, however, cracks in his story that began to show. After that famed 2008 surgery, Italy made a very public plea for Dr. Macchiarini to come and practice there. They lured him with a very compelling offer, a fully funded laboratory, a residency at the Correggi Hospital in Florence, and a full professorship at their medical school. However, the laws in Italy require that there be proof that any candidate for full professorship be completely vetted. Everyone thought that this was a done deal. He was a rock star after all, but he never did get that appointment to full professor. Given the very public nature of the job offer, no reason was ever given. But with what we know now, we can make an educated guess that they were not able to verify certain credentials. This should have been a red flag, but it was ignored by the public. He then moved on to the Karolinska Institute in Sweden, which is one of the most prestigious medical universities. This is where they select the Nobel Prize each year in medicine. There, he reinvented his technique using a plastic windpipe covered in the patient's own stem cells. This could literally change medicine, the prospect of using man-made organs instead of donated ones. After he transplanted the synthetic organ into his first patient, Macchiarini's rise to fame was unstoppable. He was featured in the New York Times and in an NBC special. Palo's regenerating windpipes were put in nearly 20 patients worldwide. Of these, the majority are dead, including that first patient. But that was just the surface level. Beyond that was the record keeping and reports, and none of the complications or deaths made it into Macchiarini's papers. He flouted other requirements too. He should have implanted these plastic tracheas into animals before humans, but he did not. 
there was no such testing done. How did he pull that off? Well, the official report later dubbed this type of behavior the bandwagon effect. This is when people are so eager to show their loyalty to someone that they hesitate to criticize them. What that boils down to is, well, if all these other people admire and respect him, I guess I will too. And with all of Paolo's fame and support, it was very easy for everyone to fall in line for him. He was seen as not only a miracle worker, but a scientific pioneer. Until 2014, when four surgeons at the Karolinska Institute dared to publicly complain, they were following up on one of Macchiarini's patients who had suffered horrible consequences from her transplant operation. She was a vibrant 24-year-old woman from Turkey whose elective surgery was botched by her original doctors when they nicked her trachea. She sought out Dr. Macchiarini to fix it. At the time, he had already performed four reportedly successful transplants. So Paolo pushed for the transplant, which had disastrous results and left the patient with debilitating complications. She needed to be suctioned every four to six hours. Then she suffered two strokes and was left partially blind. This was torturous for her and her suffering did not stop. She was operated on 191 times after she went under Dr. Macchiarini's knife. The young patient's surgical nightmare was compounded by Macchiarini's failure to administer any follow-up care. But this was typical behavior for him. He rarely stayed around to check on his patients post-operatively. His absence left his colleagues to figure out why the patient was not recovering. To do so, they sought out some of Macchiarini's research to help. These other doctors were shocked to discover that his papers did not match his patients' medical records. He had falsified the results, and he did so intentionally. He knew his patients' conditions were getting worse, not better, and he knew that before he published his paper, but he didn't care. The other doctors found so many lies and so much scientific misconduct in Macchiarini's work that they felt it was their duty to report it to Karolinska. But there was nothing done about it, and in fact, the doctors who reported it were punished. Paolo had powerful institutional supporters, and all of them bought into his lies and protected him. Another reason Macchiarini was able to continue his charade for so long was the surgeries he performed were spread out all over the world. No one was really tracking his results with the various institutions. Excuses were made that sometimes the patients were already near death, but that was contradicted by evidence that many of his other patients, including the 24-year-old Turkish woman, were otherwise healthy. Macchiarini's patients' deaths were horrific. They suffered immensely. Season three of Dr. Death investigated this case in depth. One of the doctors interviewed said that given the choice between Palo's synthetic trachea or a firing squad, he would choose the firing squad and I quote, because it would be the less painful form of execution. Paolo knew his patients were dying, but he didn't care. When the other doctors confronted him, he went on the offensive and blamed them. He threatened them, and this was his pattern for eight years. He only stopped when both his medical career and his personal life blew up in a spectacular fashion. What made Paolo think he could get away with his deceit? Was he delusional, truly believing the lies he was telling in both his personal and professional life? And how far would he go to achieve his dreams of fame and notoriety? We get support from Audible. No matter what your goals are for the new year, tackle them with a partner like Audible. Audible has a growing selection of wellness titles in all categories, including physical, mental, social, motivational, and financial wellness. Audible Originals even have the Audible Sleep Collection, which are audio experiences created to invite relaxation and sleep. I am currently enjoying Why We Sleep, 
Unlocking the Power of Sleep and Dreams by Dr. Matthew Walker. New members can try Audible free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash psyche or text psyche to 500-500. That's audible.com slash psyche. We get support from June's Journey. Step into the role of June Parker and immerse yourself in the world of June's Journey, a hidden object mystery mobile game that puts your detective skills to the test. As you search for hidden clues through mind-teasing puzzles, you'll uncover the mystery of June's sister's murder. The game features beautifully detailed scenes of the 1920s. I like how chapters are set in different locations like New York or Paris. It's always fun seeing the new setting and learning more about each character as you advance through the chapters. It is really challenging and a lot of fun. I love it. Discover your inner detective when you download June's Journey for free today on iOS and Android. Paolo claimed he felt like an outsider his entire life. He was Italian, but grew up in Switzerland, where he was the first and only Italian in school. Although he was multilingual, he actually did not speak much Italian. So when he decided to go to Italy for medical school, his professional advancement was somewhat hindered. And once again, he felt like he didn't fit in. In his mind, though, there was more to it. He thought the Italian system favored money over merit, and he believed that unless you were the son of a celebrity or a politician, you would never succeed in the Italian medical field. This was a pattern with Paolo. The fault is always shifted elsewhere. Someone or something else is always to blame for his failures. This is classic narcissist thinking, and the result is that the individual has a hard time accepting their flaws and failures. Most clinicians believe that if you scratch the surface or do a deep dive into a narcissist, you're going to find a massively insecure person. But as soon as there's a little flicker of, oh my God, did I do this? The narcissist immediately talks themselves up. No, I didn't do this. It couldn't have been my fault. For example, when the doctors confronted Paolo about his records, he began screaming and blaming them, not even giving them a chance to speak. Now, that's different than Dr. Christopher Dunch, who was the subject of the first season of Wondery's Dr. Death. When Dunch was questioned by colleagues, he would just go, I got it, I got it, we're fine. But Paolo would counterattack. I think it's the best defense is a good offense stance. He just walks in and starts shouting, which tells me that he knew he was wrong, but he refused to accept it, and by shouting, refused to even hear it. Remember, he was hoping to get a Nobel Prize for medicine, and that's about as good as it gets. If this got out, or if he admitted it, he believed that possibility would go away. Paolo's narcissism was so profound that it made him dangerous. And this is where Macchiarini and Dr. Dunch forged similar paths. They were both malignant, narcissistic psychopaths, meaning that their narcissism was so extreme that it rendered them dangerous. Classifying them as a psychopath signifies their personality disorder, of which the hallmark characteristic is a profound lack of empathy. They are callous. They don't really care about the person they are hurting. However, they can ooze charm, fake charm. When narcissism and psychopathy dance together, it's going to be bad. The average person who's not a narcissist makes a mistake and hurts someone. They're mortified, especially doctors. For a surgeon to make a mistake and to severely, possibly permanently injure or kill someone in the operating room, that's the worst thing that can happen to a surgeon. Narcissistic psychopaths don't turn off their bad behavior when they walk out of work. Paolo Macchiarini lived a very, very high-risk lifestyle in both his professional life and his personal life. And it was this behavior that eventually proved to be his undoing. He met a TV news reporter and producer named Benita Alexander. 
she was working on a TV documentary that would feature one of Macchiarini's patients, a two-year-old girl. Benita was smart and worldly, but when she and Paolo met, she was going through a tough time personally, and she was vulnerable. Her ex-husband was dying, and she was raising her daughter alone. She found that Paolo was willing to listen and give her the emotional support that she desperately needed. She was charmed by him, and he soon whisked her into a fantasy romance. He took her on lavish trips and bought her lots of presents. As their relationship became serious, he let her in on one of his secrets. He was part of an elite set of doctors that catered to the rich and famous. Paolo's M.O. is pretty typical of this type of con man. They charm. They convince their target to do things they would not normally do. And their targets will then justify the con man's actions and buy their excuses. His bragging to Benita and the idea that he was entrusting her with his secrets was another way to ingratiate himself into her life. Creating a secret of such profound magnitude and then sharing that secret? That implies, I love you so much that I'm going to let you in on something highly confidential. Paolo is showing her that he trusts her implicitly so that Benita should also trust him. But what it really shows is how grandiose he could be and what a skillful liar he was. His deceits piled up layer after layer. But laid out one by one, they offered up somewhat plausible explanations for his secretive behavior. This was the reason why he would have to fly away at a moment's notice and was not always able to tell her where he was. All of this added to the excitement of a new romance. He would frequently text her that he was leaving the Pope's house or that he had just played tennis with Bill Clinton. But it wasn't just the jet-setting lifestyle that drew her in. Paolo made an extra effort with her daughter, and they would often play music together, him on the piano, her on the violin. Benita fell madly in love with the dashing doctor, and when he popped the question, not surprisingly, she said yes. Soon after, he told her he would take care of all the wedding plans, and she was not to ask him any questions. At first, she was hesitant, but... She trusted him, so she agreed. As he organized the wedding, Paolo's grandiosity got the better of him, and he began telling Benita about all the important people who were coming. This was going to be a once-in-a-lifetime event. The guest list included people like the former president of France, the president of Russia, the Obamas, and the Clintons. Paolo told her that not only was he their doctor, but that Bill Clinton was one of his best friends. He also said that John Legend and Andrea Bocelli were going to sing at the ceremony. But the biggest part is that they would marry at the Castle Gandolfo, the Pope's summer palace, and that the Pope would officiate. He didn't tell her this all at once, of course. He went as far as she would let him, and I think he was probably feeding off of her responses. He loved to lie, and he was addicted to it. He would spread it out slowly and add in half-truths along the way. And the lies got bigger and more outlandish with each telling. Hearing these details, the natural question is, was he delusional? Did he believe the things that he was telling her? No. Believing that the contrails of an airplane in the sky are leaking poisonous fumes into your molars, that is a delusion. You don't see that. You merely believe it and nothing can talk someone out of a delusion. But most delusions are not dangerous, and that does not describe this situation. Paolo knew what he was saying was not true. He just needed everyone else to believe it. So then, was this guy a pathological liar? And what does that even mean? That term gets thrown around a lot, but basically, a pathological liar has a clear motive behind their lies. They are lying for personal gain and to manipulate. They sound confident when they lie. They don't care who the lies hurt. And that type of lying is a symptom of antisocial and narcissistic personality disorders. In fact, 
the word pathological is a Greek word, and it means the science of disease. The lying is a disease, and they cannot stop it. People like that, they lie when the truth really would be much easier. Psychopaths start lying when they're very young, and when they know the difference between telling the truth and lying, they still choose to lie because it's fun for them. These type of pathological liars might start out early in life by tricking mommy, and they're always pushing the boundaries. They're always thinking, let's see how big of a lie I can tell today and get away with it. But not all liars are pathological. Others are compulsive liars. They lie out of habit. Small things, big things, it doesn't matter to them. Their lies are often spontaneous. It is also a coping mechanism often learned in childhood. But unlike pathological liars, they are not always so cunning or manipulative. Often their stories just don't add up. Pathological liars generally have no physical tells. They are too good at lying. They feel no shame when they are caught in a lie. They simply try to cover it up with a bigger lie. If that doesn't work, they simply move on to the next person to lie to. A compulsive liar's tell is that they are not good at lying. Everyone knows they're lying. Their lies simply don't add up. I believe Paolo Macchiarini was a pathological liar. He did not care that there were people dying because of his lies. In fact, he was already planning on doing another surgery, even after the disastrous results to his previous patients. And he knew that the results would most likely be the same. He was a con man, and to be a con man, you have to be incredibly good at your lying. Con men are pathological liars. They lie for personal gain and don't care who that affects. In an explosive article about Paolo published in Vanity Fair, the head of the psychiatry service at Massachusetts General Hospital said, Macchiarini is the extreme form of a con man. He's clearly bright and has accomplishments, but he can't contain himself. There's a void in his personality that he seems to want to fill by conning more and more people. When the reporter asked how Macchiarini stacks up to Bernie Madoff, he laughed and said Madoff was an ordinary con man with a Ponzi scheme. He never claimed to be the chairman of the Federal Reserve. He did not suggest he was part of a secret international society of bankers. This guy is really good. He was really good, and his ego demanded that he go after a challenge. When he met Benita, she was producing his special and was not allowed to date him. He pursued Benita and convinced her to violate her own ethical code as a journalist and begin a relationship with him. Early in the relationship, she told him that they could no longer be together until the story was done. He continually called her and manipulated her until she finally relented. He pulled out every stop to win her, topping every grand gesture with another. But even Benita had to question that the Pope himself would marry two divorced people, one of whom was not even Catholic. Paolo insisted that as the Pope's personal physician, that this was the least of what he would do. After her initial skepticism, she was fully on board, along with the guests from 17 countries who were flying in from around the world to the wedding. He went so far as to tell the designer of her wedding gown that the Pope had agreed to give him and his partner communion. This would be a landmark event, given that the designer was gay and the Catholic Church did not give communion to homosexuals. It was a bold, fantastic lie, and yet no one questioned it. Macchiarini's lies were ridiculous. He was relying on the gullibility of other people. After she quit her job and was preparing to leave the United States to get married, Benita received an alarming email from a colleague with an article about the Pope. There was no way that he was going to marry them. He had a pre-scheduled trip to Latin America on the day of their wedding. Benita was furious and confronted Paolo. He denied everything. After she continued to question him about all the discrepancies in his stories, he told her that he was actually a CIA sniper, and that was why he had to lie. 
This is typical behavior for pathological liars, to think that telling a bigger lie will make everything more believable. I've seen this before with people who get caught in a morass of lies. As they are being crushed under the weight of it all, they frequently do the CIA thing. I read a story about a judge who was always embellishing his accomplishments. And when he finally got caught in all the lies, he told them, I was in the CIA, so I couldn't tell you the truth. The CIA is a secret organization. So the liar thinks that saying that covers his tracks because who would be able to prove that they were not in the CIA? The fact that he added the sniper thing to it, I find hilarious. This was the last straw for Benita, but she wanted to find out the extent of his lies. So she pretended that all was well and continued to see him. At the same time, she hired private investigators in Italy. They quickly uncovered that he was still married. From there, the lies about his personal and professional life continued to emerge. The humiliation, anger and shame that she felt drove her to discover all that she could so that she could expose him. I have no doubt that Paolo's history of lying started way back as a child in Switzerland. A young boy's first lie is not something that ends up with you in an operating room about to transplant something you've created into another human being. It's like a pyramid scheme. It started out with little lies that became medium ones. You start out small, and if you get away with it, maybe next time it's a little more. Look at how far he got before he was questioned. He almost successfully lied his way to a Nobel Prize for medicine. That is huge. It is the top of the pyramid. These kinds of people will never stop lying. They don't stop until they are stopped or they die. Both narcissism and psychopathy are personality disorders. When I was studying clinical psychiatry and abnormal psychology, there were only six personality disorders. And of those six, two of them are exactly what we are talking about. Narcissism, or rather primary narcissism, and antisocial personality disorder. That's the umbrella term for psychopath or sociopath. A person is believed to be born with these traits. It's all predetermined by DNA. It is not caused by a bad or traumatic childhood, but those things can make it worse. These personality disorders can evolve and develop, but most of these traits can be seen in an individual by their teenage years. There's no way to change them after that. A psychopath can change their behavior, but not their personality. For example, if your DNA says that you're going to be a blonde, you're going to be a blonde, unless of course you color your hair. Just like if your DNA says you're going to be a narcissistic psychopath, that's what you're going to be. Except that you are in control of your behavior and don't have to act like a narcissistic psychopath. There are millions of kids who grow up in this world with awful childhoods, and most of them are good people. They are not psychopaths. Not much is really known about Paolo's home life as a kid. We do not know if there was abuse at home or something else going on that was traumatic. If we assume nothing catastrophic happened to him, then it would lead me to conclude that his psychopathy was in his genetics. By the way, there are a lot of surgeons that have what's called psychopathic tendencies. The Robert Hare Psychopathy Checklist that we discussed in the Eileen Warnos episode is a test that questions whether or not an individual displays traits of a psychopath. Anyone who scores over 30 is considered to be a psychopath. The top two professions that continually scored the highest were politicians and surgeons. It kind of makes sense that surgeons would be on this list. They have to have nerves of steel and be able to turn off their emotions in order to operate on someone. But having a few traits of a psychopath does not make one a psychopath. Paolo was warm and friendly to his patients before the surgery, but would disappear after. That's not standard protocol from a surgeon. Most check in to see how their patient is doing in recovery. When Mackie Arini's young Turkish patient heard he was finally coming back to the hospital, she was excited to see her miracle doctor. She took the time and excruciating effort to get dressed up and look nice for him. 
She had to have the nurses help her bathe and put on her makeup. And she sat, strapped up in a wheelchair, waiting for him. When he came into the hospital, he knew she was waiting for him. But instead of speaking with her, he went straight to yelling at the doctors. Then he just left without visiting her. The doctor said that they were as stunned by him not stopping by or even walking 10 feet into the ICU to see his patient as they were by the fact that he was yelling at them for trying to help save her life. They couldn't believe how cold he was to her. This does not surprise me. Narcissistic psychopaths rarely feel any kind of empathy for anyone. They can feel anger, disgust, and even indignation but they do not feel warm and loving feelings that go along with caring for someone. He just wanted to get out of there as fast as possible. He did not want to face his failures in front of other doctors. Embarrassment is like kryptonite to a narcissist. After that happened, she spiraled down even faster. Her doctors explained later, as they put it, she interpreted his avoidance in two ways. First, I'm not your doctor anymore. And second, there is no hope. You are going to die. She had been through hell and wanted to speak with the man that she trusted to do the operation. And he couldn't be bothered with her. She had served her purpose and he was moving on. Most psychopaths lack a moral compass or conscience. It makes sense that he would feel no responsibility or remorse about her state and would feel no need to see her. He also knew that when he wrote his papers, citing all of his successful surgeries, that his patients had suffered horrible consequences, even death. But he chose to keep doing the surgeries because it helped advance him, no matter the cost to others. He knew the papers he wrote were falsified, but that did not stop him. And that is also a part of his narcissism. The problem for narcissists and psychopaths is that they don't think things through to their logical conclusion. There was no way that Paolo could sustain the lies in his personal and professional life. It was only a matter of time before they caught up with him. And because the truth was filled with devastating consequences, the fallout for him would be monumental. If I asked you how many subscriptions you have, would you be able to list all of them and how much you're paying? If you would have asked me this question before I started using Rocket Money, I would have said yes, but let me tell you, I would have been so wrong. I can't believe how many I had and all the money I was wasting. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has helped save its members an average of $720 a year with over 500 million in canceled subscriptions. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash Wondery. That's rocketmoney.com slash Wondery. Rocketmoney.com slash Wondery. When the story of Paolo's web of lies was made known by Benita and his medical colleagues, his fall from grace became an international headline. And after that, even more of his lies were uncovered. One of the more perplexing ones had to do with Benita's daughter. At the beginning of their relationship, Benita was amazed when he took the time to play music with the young girl. But it turned out Paolo wasn't really playing her piano at all it had a self-playing feature that she did not even know about until after their relationship was over. He also bragged to Benita that her engagement ring was worth over $100,000 when it was really only worth a thousand. And when Paolo took her to meet his mother, he proceeded to translate everything for Benita. She did not know then that his wife of many years lived just a few miles away. He loved taking that risk and it worked out in his favor. It is common for people with Paolo's disorders to court danger. They don't feel fear the way normal people do. There's no anxiety associated with a risk. That makes it easier to do bad things, like lying to someone while they look him in the eye. 
I'm primarily talking about psychopaths and sociopaths. A narcissist does feel fear and anxiety, but not about lying. As I've said, Paolo was a narcissist and a psychopath. So his risk-taking was more of a, see, I'm smarter than you, and this proves it. For him, it was like a game, and he needed to win it. When Benita gave up the job she loved and pulled her daughter out of school to move to Paolo's home in Barcelona, that was when he really won. She gave up everything for him, and he did not care about the cost to her. There was no way for him to actually marry her. He was still married to his first wife and apparently had a woman that lived with him in Spain as well. I have no idea what his plan was for her, but I can tell you that it did not end up with them living happily ever after. His professional life, like a tornado, caused a lot of destruction. Not only were his surgeries a sham, it ruined the professional lives of the majority of his colleagues and supporters. A few weeks after the damaging Vanity Fair article came out, a documentary called The Experiments was released on Swedish television. The three-part series further exposed Macchiarini's deceptive medical practices. The series claimed that the artificial windpipes were not the medical miracle that everyone had thought and that they did more harm than good. The Karolinska Institute launched a formal inquiry and then announced that he would not be returning to work there. The inquiry also found that he had been given special treatment due to his relationships and had basically been able to do what he wanted without any consequences. Macchiarini never followed through with the required steps needed to get his artificial organs approved he never tested on animals, and that's a requirement, not an option. He didn't do a risk assessment of the procedures, and he did not get government permits for any of the components that they used. And finally, he never even sought the approval of the Medical Ethics Board of Stockholm. Paolo argued that he did his surgeries under the compassionate use loophole. He also said that he was not doing research, so he should not be held to that standard. The investigators did not buy his explanations and he was dismissed. In true Palo fashion, he continued to stick to his story. He responded that he did not accept the findings of the disciplinary board. His main backer, Harriet Wahlberg, was the vice chancellor of the Karolinska Institute when he was recruited. And even though there were many red flags in his resume, she greenlighted his employment. She had moved on to become the chancellor of all Swedish universities, but after the scandal broke, she lost her job. The vice chancellor, the dean of research, and even the secretary general of the Nobel Committee resigned, and the entire university board was dismissed. In 2016, the Swedish police investigated whether or not he was guilty of involuntary manslaughter. They dropped the investigation in 2017 because even though they found his medical treatment in four of the five cases to be negligent, they could not prove criminal responsibility. They did not pursue it because, as they say, the patients might have died anyway. In 2019, an Italian court sentenced him to 16 months on parole for abuse of office and forging documents. In September 2020, Swedish courts indicted Paolo Macarini for aggravated assault related to the three deadly procedures he performed at the Karolinska Institute. Paolo Macchiarini was looking for a path to stardom. He presented himself as the perfect package, handsome, charismatic, and smart, and he promised everyone a better world. The head of Boston's Mass General Hospital explains it like this. We're taught from an early age that when something is too good to be true, it's not true. And yet, we ignore the signals. People's critical judgment gets suspended. And in this case, that happened at both the personal and institutional level. Paolo pled not guilty to every charge that was ever made against him. I don't believe he will ever accept any responsibility. His narcissism prevents him from thinking he could do anything wrong. 
and his psychopathy prevents him from caring about the consequences of his actions. Remarkably, it seemed for a bit that no one else was going to hold him accountable either. In June of 2022, Paolo was cleared of two counts of aggravated assault. But thankfully, one year later, a Swedish appeals court found him guilty of gross assault and sentenced him to two and a half years in prison. He will likely serve those in Spain where he now lives. It is not even remotely what he really deserves. But at least, it's something. Once again, for more about Dr. Paolo Macchiarini, check out Season 3 of the Wondery podcast Dr. Death, Miracle Man, and Season 2 of the original TV series Dr. Death, now airing on Peacock. From Wondery and Tree Fort Media, this is Killer Psyche. I'm your host, Candace DeLong. This episode was written and produced by Lisa Ammerman and Julie Burke. Additional writing and director of research is Anne Liu. Mix and sound design by Joshua Morales. Head of audio, Tom Monahan. With audio assistance from Katie Corpy and Matt Dyson. Jada Williams is our production coordinator. The executive in charge of production for Treefort is Oscar Guido. From Amazon Music and Wondery, the producer is Stephanie Wachneen. And the co-executive producer is Julie Burt. Lastly, our executive producers are myself, Candace DeLong, Kelly Garner, and Lisa Ammerman for Treefort, and Marsha Louie and Aaron O'Flaherty for Wondery. The series is produced by Wondery and Treefort Media. Being an actual royal is never about finding your happy ending. But the worst part is, if they step out of line or fall in love with the wrong person, it changes the course of history. I'm Arisha Skidmore-Williams. And I'm Brooke Ziffrin. We've been telling the stories of the rich and famous on the hit Wondery show, Even the Rich, and talking about the latest celebrity news on Rich and Daily. We're going all over the world on our new show, Even the Royals. We'll be diving headfirst into the lives of the world's kings, queens, and all the wannabes in their orbit throughout history. Think succession meets the crown meets real life. We're going to pull back the gilded curtain and show how royal status might be bright and shiny, but it comes at the expense of, well, everything else. Like your freedom, your privacy, and sometimes even your head. Follow Even the Royals on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen to Even the Royals early and ad-free right now by joining Wondery Plus.